All right, so today we're going to take a look at section 7.5. Okay, and so we're going to take a look at what we at least we knew before break, right? Maybe some things fell out of our head during break, but what we did know before break, um, we looked at a lot of verifying trig identities, all right? We learned so many different tools, reciprocal, quotient, odd, even, co-function, Pythagorean, some difference, double angle, half angle. We learned so many of those and they all require us to use a little bit of algebra in there as well. And um, I know that for some of us, the discussion maybe feel like, oh, like, why do I have to do this thing? But one of the reasons I like us to do the discussions is because it, it does sort of encourage you to verbalize some of these strategies, right? And even if you're having a hard time verbalizing them, being able to read someone else's strategy might actually help you sort of figure out how you want to study and how you want to prepare, okay? Um, the other thing that we've talked about, we looked at actually like calculating things, like finding sum and difference of trig functions, um, finding exact values of double and half angles. And so all of these things would be important to uh, sort of review before that exam on Wednesday. Okay. Um, but if you take a look at the sort of grade breakdown on that topic list, 50 points are going to be on this verifying the trig identity. All right. Then I'm not saying that for you to be like, oh, well, I guess that's 50 points that I'm not going to get any of those points. Right. Like I want us to be like, OK, like this is an important process. The idea of being able to think and reason through a problem that is so open ended is really what we're training ourselves to do here. OK. And so what we're going to finish this chapter off with. <clears throat> Um, okay, I see a great question in the chat. We can put the identities on our reference sheet. Absolutely. Um, I would make sure to maybe write the names of them as well, right? So you don't want to just list them all out, but like, oh, this is the sum and difference one, or this is the half angle, or this is the double angle. Okay. I think that would be really wonderful. All right, um, what's new? Solving equations is what we're going to be focusing on right now. Um, and we're going to solve equations using a lot of the tools that we've already learned. So we're learning, we're going to apply identities, we're going to apply algebra and inverse trigonometry, which is a throwback to like the very first unit that we did. Okay. Um, lastly, we're going to take a look at sort of two different categories of solution. Okay. And so these two categories are, we're going to be looking at solutions over the interval zero to two pi. That'll be one type of question. And then separately, we're going to look at finding so the general solutions of an equation. All right. And this will be really important for us to think about as we read the directions for a question to think about how we're going to answer them. And um, we're actually going to do both the um, both types of solutions as we go through for like most of the problems. You will not be asked to do both types for the same problem on the exam, um, but I want us to sort of practice seeing the differences and the similarities between them. OK, because a lot of times we can use one of them to help us find the other one. All right. And so that being said, we're going to hop into our examples. All right. We have a bunch of examples to go through today. I think for some of us, that's actually like a really good thing because we get to practice things over and over again. Um, and so we're going to start with our first category here where we're looking at linear trigonometric equations. OK. All right, so let's take a look at this equation. We have sine x equals negative one, okay? And so if someone were to say, I would like you to find the solutions over this interval zero to two pi, that would be having them secretly say, find the answers in one rotation around. our good old friend, the unit circle, okay? And so if we think back to the very first unit that we did, we've actually answered questions like this before, 
all right? In fact, when someone says sine x equals negative one, they're asking us where is the y value of an angle negative one, right? Where is the y value of an angle negative one, all right? So as rusty as we might feel after the break, take a look at that unit circle of yours, which should be like next to you during every single lecture, all right? Find, find that unit circle and tell me what value or values do we have a y value of negative one? We have it at three pi over two. We do indeed have it at three pi over two, right? Are there any other angles when we go just one time around the unit circle that have a y value of negative one? No, right? This is the only one and so in this case, this equation has one solution, okay? So sometimes we're gonna have one solution. Sometimes we're gonna have more than one solution, but we really need to know and trust ourselves like, okay, I know for sure there's only one solution because when I look at the unit circle, there's only one angle that has a Y value of negative one. Okay. All right, so, I said the other type of solution, like I said blue, was a general solution, okay? And so what does that mean in terms of making things, um, like what solutions would we be looking for, okay? And so what this means is we're looking for all solutions as many, rotations around the unit circle as possible. Okay. In other words, someone might say three pi over two but we could also keep going around the unit circle and give it a different name, okay? And so to sort of illustrate this fact, let me go ahead and draw a, um, draw a unit circle here. All right, so we've got our unit circle. Oh. That's not bad for a Monday after a holiday, right? But where, where is our answer that we saw from the first part? Our answer was down here, right? Three pi over two. But I could also get to this by going an extra time around the unit circle, right? If I went one more time around the unit circle, I would be adding another rotation, okay? I could actually go two times around the unit circle and get back to the same spot. Or I could go in the negative direction as many times as I want and get back to the same spot, right? And so when we say general solutions, we mean we wanna account for every single time that we go around that unit circle, all right? But we're not gonna sit and list out all of those possibilities. That would be just madness to list out every single one, okay? But what we can do is learn a little bit of new notation to help us write this, okay? So we can say x equals three pi over two plus, let's write this in words first, every, rotation around the unit circle. 
all right? So three pi over two plus every rotation around the unit circle. Now, mathematicians, we don't really like to write all these words. And so we're gonna have some symbols that say the same thing, okay? So here it is in symbols. We're gonna write X equals three pi over two plus, someone tell me how many radians are in one rotation of the unit circle? Two pi. Two pi, excellent. Okay, so ready? We're gonna say plus two pi. That would be like one rotation, right? If I just kept it like this, three pi over two plus two pi, that would be like one extra rotation. But I wanna say every single possible rotation. So I'm gonna add a little letter K, two pi K, all right? And I think we've kind of seen this before, but I wanna make sure we really understand that notation where afterwards we're gonna define K, right? If we just put a K there, but we don't tell anyone what it means, then it's really hard for us to be like explaining our reasoning. And so what K stands for is K, we write this little E, I think we've seen that symbol before as well, and a Z with a double line, right? Well, let's break down what each of these pieces mean, right? So this is our solution. The two pi k represents the rotations around the unit circle, right? Rotations around the unit circle. And in particular, this letter k means that k is, anybody remember what this fancy letter Z stands for? Hmm, okay. So let's make a little note for ourselves. Uh, all right. That Z actually comes from this German word. Okay, so that's why we choose Z. But what it stands for in mathematics is it stands for integer, okay? Just like Dallas says. So if we wanna say integers, we write this fancy Z, all right? All textbooks will print it all fancy and scripty. I just sort of cheat that a little bit by writing a regular Z and then just like a double line down that vertical part, okay? But what does this tell us, right? It tells us that we know where we're finding our solution, and then we can count around the unit circle as many times as we want. And because k is an integer, we can go in the positive direction, or we could go in the negative direction, okay? So we don't need like a plus minus sign here because our k could be positive or negative, all right? And so that's the difference that I really want to highlight between the solutions over the interval, which we've talked about here in the red, versus the general solutions over here on the right. Okay. And for Wednesday's exam, I want us to be able to do both versions of these. Okay. And I think what makes this part right here, this notation, really relevant for us is especially as we move up in our mathematics. Sometimes the answer keys become a lot more symbolic. And if we don't know how to read the symbols, then the answer keys might not make sense, right? And so we want to make sure that we're learning how to read that math and digest it just as much as we're learning how to do that math, okay? So let's go ahead and try a few more examples, all right? And so we'll move on to example number two. All right, so a cosine of x equals one half. And I'm wondering if someone can tell me in words what this question is asking us for. 
when someone says cosine x equals one half, what are they actually asking you for? Where is the x value of one over half? Perfect. Where is the x value one half? Great. All right. And uh, what do we get when we look at our handy dandy unit circle? Um, okay, great. I would disagree with that as well. All right, I agree that it is pi over three is one option. And I would argue that there is a second option as well. Perfect, five pi over three, all right? So if I were to sort of draw these on the unit circle, all right, maybe we use a pink situation over here. Pi over three is about here, all right? So this would be pi over three. And then let's see. Five pi over three is in which quadrant? Yeah, it's in quadrant four, right? And in particular, we would find it down here. All right. So if we say find the solutions over the interval zero to two pi, those are the only two times where when we go one time around the unit circle, we have an x value of one half, okay? So that would be sufficient for our answer for solutions over the interval. However, if someone says, hey, I'd like you to write the general solutions, right? I want you to tell me how I can find every single time I go around the unit circle, right? So like the first time I stop at this pink one, I could also go around one more time and get back to there, right? That would be the same as saying plus two pi. What would I do if I went around the unit circle twice to get back to that same pink point? I would write plus, not two pi. What would I write? How many pi's did I go? if I did two rotations of this circle? Two pi k. Two pi k would be a general one, but if I went exactly twice around, that would mean k is two. And so we would get four pi. Does that make sense? We go around, okay. All right, so our general solutions, let's break them down into two different categories. The first one, we can say pi over three plus, now if we wanna list them all out, you would say plus two pi k. We also need to, for our audience say k is an integer, okay? And this would correspond to our, all the ones that match up to this pink solution, okay? If I want to write an equivalent statement for the five pi over three, I would say X equals five pi over three plus as many rotations as I want. And I say that by writing two pi K where K is an integer. Right. All right. So I have a question. Yes, for sure. What's up? So in general solutions, 
And if like we have more than one answer in the, in the like the solutions over the interval, do we have to write it for each one? Mm, how would you write them together? Mm, I'm not sure. Okay, so you ask a really good question, right? Because I think we want to be efficient as mathematicians and we want to write precisely what we need to write, but we don't want to write a lot more. And so in this case, I'm going to say, yes, we do have to write them separately. But in this, um, in I think example five, we're going to see that maybe we can condense it sometime. Okay, so let's be on the lookout for that. But the first few questions are really meant for us to kind of develop this idea of like, I'm grown up enough to write this kind of stuff. Okay, so let's take a look at example three. All right, so we have two cosine x minus three equals negative five. All right, um, how? would we get cosine x all by itself? Like, like clearing for it, like moving the stuff to the other side. Sorry, say that again. Like moving the um, other stuff. So like the, it was a negative three would be a plus three to the negative mm -hmm. five. Good, good. So yeah, let's get rid of that negative three first, right? So we'll just add it to the other side. We'll get two cosine x equals, let's be careful here, negative five plus three gives me negative two. Great. And how do I get cosine by itself here? Great, divide by two. So we'll get cosine x equals negative one, all right? Now, this is asking us where is the x value equal to negative one, right? So where on the unit circle do we have cosine equal to negative one? Great. All right. And I would agree. I would agree that these solutions over the interval are going to happen right there. Okay. Now, that is the only time where cosine is going to be at negative one. And so that is the only version we need to give here. We can just say x equals pi. And when we talk about our general solutions, all right then we can say, oh, pi plus 2 pi k, where k represents an integer, OK? Any questions on example three? All right, so let's ramp things up a little bit. Let's take a look at example four, all right? Can someone tell me in words what we're looking for here when it says cosecant x equals negative two? Like the one over a y? Yeah, exactly. We're looking for a one over y value, which equals negative two. And we can take that one step further, right? We can say that that's really saying one over sine x equals negative two. 
And just like Omar says, that's the same as saying sine x equals negative one half. Okay. So all of this, which we learned weeks ago as like a, an actual problem, turns out now to be part of a larger problem. Right. So if you put in that effort to really understand that earlier, awesome, because now it's really going to pay off. OK, so let's draw a quick picture here. All right. And so where on our unit circle would we have sine x equal to negative one half. Eleven pi over six. I would agree and that it's an eleven pi over six and seven pi over six. Seven Perfect. pi over six. Perfect. All right, we got a seven pi over six. We got an eleven pi over six, and let's draw those on our unit circle. Oops. So we've got a seven pi over six. We've got an eleven pi over six, and seven pi over six is right here, and eleven pi over six is right here. All right, so we've got these two. And if we wanted to write our general solution, okay, we would have to write these ones separately, right? So we would write x equals, the first one would be the pink one, seven pi over six, plus as many rotations as we want, right? Plus that two pi k, where k represents an integer that tells us how many times we go around. Right. Separately, we would have the orange one, x equals 11 pi over 6 plus 2 pi k, where k is an integer. And that would correspond to the orange one on the graph. Okay. All right. So up until this point, I've just been making you write a lot of this plus two pi k, right? And I'm saying over and over like what it means, right? How many times we go around the unit circle. But in example five, we'll start to see sometimes we can shortcut that a little bit, right? So we always wanna be on the lookout for when can we say it in a more straightforward way, all right? So let's take a look at example five, all right? So example five, we've got tangent of x minus pi over two equals one, all right? Now this question is a little bit trickier for us, all right? And so I really wanna take some time to walk through this one. So let's imagine for a moment that this whole blob inside of the parentheses Let's replace it with just one thing, okay? So in other words, I want us to write this like tangent of theta equals one, where theta is the same thing as this x minus pi over two, okay? And the reason why I want us to think that is because I think when someone says tangent of theta equals one, that's a little bit easier to answer than tangent of x minus pi over two equals one, okay? So let's make the question a little bit more straightforward for ourselves right now and remind ourselves where tangent of theta equals one, All right? So on your unit circle, if you could find the places where theta gives you a tangent of one, you can put those into the chat or you can unmute yourself. Pi over four. So we're looking to answer this question. 
Yeah, to give us one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've got pi over four, I would agree. And also five pi over four, okay? I know that tangent is a little bit trickier in general because it's not on the unit circle, but it would be um, a really good thing to feel like, okay, before I walk out of this class, I know how to accurately find tangent, okay? So here's what we're gonna do now. This is our theta. So theta can equal this pi over four, or it can equal five pi over four. But now we're gonna put those two pieces together. We're gonna say X minus pi over two can equal pi over four. And then separately, we're gonna say X minus pi over two can equal five pi over four. So X minus pi over two equals pi over four, or X minus pi over two equals five pi over four. So we are not done answering the question yet. All right, this one's a little bit trickier, A, because of the tangent, but B, we have something in here that's not just an X, okay? How do I get X by itself in both of these cases, right? Because my ultimate goal is to find X. Perfect. We're just going to rely on our algebra. We're going to say, I have an X minus something. I want to get rid of it. So I'm going to add it to both sides. Perfect. So we're going to get X equals pi over four plus pi over two, or uh, X equals five pi over four plus pi over two. All right. I am going to ask you to add some fractions. What do we get when we add those two fractions? And separately, what do we get when we add these two fractions? I would have to disagree with those answers. I thought seven pi over four. For which one, the left one or the right one? Mm, the five pi over four pi over two. Yeah, this one should be seven pi over four. And Matthew, I agree with you. This one should be three pi over four, okay? And so let's go ahead and actually draw these on a picture again, all right? I know I've been drawing the pictures and part of that is just to remind us that like, we can always sort of see what our answers are going to be, like how they relate to our unit circle. But the other reason why I wanted to draw them is because sometimes from the picture, we can actually answer Ellie's question about like, can we write it as just one thing or do we have to write them separately, okay? And so let's go ahead and we'll call this one the pink one, three pi over four. And we'll call seven pi over four the orange one. And so three pi over four is like right here. Okay. And seven pi over four, can someone describe to me, excuse me, where seven pi over four is in relation to three pi over four? So not just like, where is it, but how does it relate to this three pi over four? It should mirror it on the unit circle, so it should make a linear line. Sorry, say that last part again. 
It should make a linear equation through the line. What do you mean by linear equation? Um, if you're looking at the unit circle and you flip the line across, so right now it's in quadrant two, it would flip to quadrant four and keep the line going. Ah. And as such, it makes a one line that's straight, which would be linear. Ah, like this. Yeah. Okay. All right. I would agree that three pi over four and seven pi over four happen to be sort of like Hmm. How far apart are these two on the unit circle? Okay. Yeah, I would agree that they are pi radians apart from each other, right? I could go a half circle and get from the orange to the pink. I could go another half circle and get back from the pink to the orange. And so every time I go a half circle, I land on one of the solutions. So if this happens, okay, if this happens, we can say the following thing, all right? So, since the solutions are halfway around the unit circle from each other, we can write a general solution as one equation, okay? So here's how we can write them. We generally pick the smaller one. So in this case, I would pick three pi over four. Okay. Usually say, let's go to the smallest one first or the closest one first. In all the other ones, I've written plus two pi k. What do you think I'm going to write here? Yeah, we're going to write pi k, right? Because we're only, every time we go, half rotation, we get to a new solution. Half rotation, we get to a new solution. And if two pi is the full rotation, then pi is going to be half the rotation. So we say plus pi k, where k is an integer. Okay. This one encompasses both the orange one and the pink one in the same answer, all right? So if you are looking at your answers and you realize, just like Avi pointed out, oh shoot, they're like exactly halfway around the unit circle from each other, you can condense them, all right? And this is also like, if you're looking at an answer key and someone has a plus pi k and not a plus two pi k, and you're like, where did the other solution go? It's likely that they condense them into the single solution, all right? All right, let's take a look at, I think two more examples, and then we'll take our first break, all right? So <clears throat> let's take a look at example six over here. All right. Someone tell me how I might isolate just the three theta. All right. So how do I get the thing inside the parentheses all by itself?
Um, I actually just want us to get three theta all by itself, like using algebra. Maybe it would be easier for us to think about how do we get sine three theta all by itself? Great, so we're gonna subtract the root two and then we're gonna divide by two, excellent, all right? So we end up with sine of three theta equals negative root two over two. Now, here's how we're going to do this. I actually want us to find some of the solutions here. Then we're going to pop over and look at the general solutions. And then we're actually going to use the general solutions to help us finish off the solutions over the interval 0 to 2 pi. Okay, I know that seems kind of roundabout. But sometimes having more than one method actually helps us solve that problem because we can use one to help us with the other, okay? And so I'm wondering uh, from your unit circle, if you could tell me which angles have a y value of negative root two over two. Seven pi over four. I would agree seven pi over four is one of them. And it looks like Ian's got the other one, five pi over four. Love it, love it. Okay. So we're gonna stop here for a moment, okay? This, once you use your unit circle to find like what three theta equals, my recommendation would be to pop over and look at the general solutions for a moment, okay? So I'm gonna write three theta equals five pi over four plus two pi k, where k is an integer, okay? If three theta equals five pi over four plus two pi k, how do I use algebra to get just theta on the left hand side? Mm -hmm. Exactly, we divide by three, right? And so let's divide by three. But here's the catch. If I'm dividing by three, I better divide every single thing by three, okay? So I divide by three, I get theta equals, what does this first term become if I divide by three? Take five pi over four, I divide it by three, I indeed get five pi over 12. Great. I better divide this by three too. Okay, so if you're not looking at the screen right now, look at the screen, I would divide this term by three as well. Okay, what do I get when I divide two pi k by three? Two pi over three k. And where is the k? The k can either be next to the pi or it can be on the outside. You're multiplying it in anyway. Great. So two pi over three k, where k is still 
an integer, okay? So yeah, we do divide everything by three, okay? Now I'm gonna ask you to do one last thing. And this last thing I'm gonna ask you to do is actually gonna be what helps us to find our solutions over the internet. Humor me for a moment. And if I wanted to add these two together, I would need a common denominator, right? And so let's keep this 5 pi over 12 as it is. But can you write 2 pi over 3 as something over 12? What does that give us? Yep, exactly. All right. So let's go ahead. All right, because this has been a very roundabout problem, right? We started here, we went over to here, and now I'm claiming that this is going to help us answer the question. All right. So here's what I want us to do. We're going to come back over here. This gives us a solution of 5 pi over 12, right? 5 pi over 12, because I divide 5 pi over 4 by 3. But I want to get all of the solutions that happen between 0 and 2 pi. Let's add one of these, 8 pi over 12. All right, so let's work with some fractions. I take 5 pi over 12, I add 8 pi over 12, I get 13 pi over 12. Here's one solution. Here is another solution. Right. Um, how do I write two pi in terms of like pi over 12? In other words, how many pi over 12s are there in two pi? Mm, like. Yeah, 24 of them, okay. Do you think there's more solutions as I go around the unit circle? Like, do you think I can add 8 pi over 12 more times and still be one rotation in the unit circle? I think so, because 13 plus 8 is 21, and it's less than Great. So let's add 8 pi over 12 one more time, and we'll get 21 pi over 12, just like Ellie said. Okay. Are there more? Can I add 8 pi over 12 more times? No, I don't know. Let's, let's try adding it. Let's see. Plus 8 pi over 12. It's kind of like blackjack, right? We got over the number we wanted. In other words, there were 24 pi over 12 in one rotation of the unit circle. But if I add 8 pi over 12 one more time, I get 29. That's too high. This one is not 
in our solution. But these three all come from this three theta equals five pi over four. Let's try something similar with this one. Three theta equals seven pi over four. So we're gonna do something kind of like this, all right? But just with seven pi over four, not five pi over four. So three theta equals seven pi over four plus two pi k, where k represents an integer. All right, help me out with the arithmetic here. I divide everything by three. Tell me what the first term equals. Tell me what the second term equals. All right, I agree, we get a seven pi over 12 plus exactly two pi over three K where K is an integer. And just because we know we're gonna go back and find all those solutions, let's find that common denominator before we go back to that side. Okay, so we could say theta equals seven pi over 12 plus eight pi over 12 K where k is an integer, right? And now, let's, let me make sure I color code these. We've got this one. And we've got this one. All right, so now we're gonna follow a similar pattern to what we did here, all right? Except our starting point is gonna be theta equals seven pi over 12 right, this seven pi over 12. And we're gonna play the same game. We're gonna add eight pi over 12 as many times as we can until we bust, right? Or we get over the number that we want. And in this case, that number's 24, okay? So we add eight pi over 12, we get theta equals 15 pi over 12, all right? So far, so good. We've got this one, we've got this one. Let's try adding it one more time. And we get theta equals, let's see, 15 plus eight gives me, ooh, 23 pi over 12. So like super close to 24 pi over 12, but just barely under. So it's still within one rotation, okay? I'm so close to two pi. I'm so close to 24 pi over 12. I'm not gonna worry about writing another adding eight pi because I know if I add any in, in eight pi over 12, I'm gonna go over. So I don't need to do that, okay? But the purpose of this question is to have us think about this three theta. Like what happens when the thing inside the parentheses is not just theta, okay? Or not just X. And so we will need to follow something sort of like this, okay? All right. So I think based on the time, it might be better to take a break right now, all right? So let's see, it is 10.38. Let's be back at 10.50 a.m., okay? So we'll be back at 10.50. And when we come back, we're gonna have a chance to look over one that's sort of similar here. Um, and then we're gonna move away from linear trigonometric equations and talk about quadratic ones. All right, so we're going to bring back the world of factoring, and then we're going to finish off the day with how do we use all the identities we learned to solve some of these questions, okay? So I'll see you back here at 10.50.
Now there's a lot of different ways to factor, but I, I like to start with sort of the first term. If I have a two X squared or two Y squared, I know I have to have like a two Y and a Y. Like those are my only options for the first terms in my binomials. But I also know that the outer terms and the inner terms, they have to add or subtract to make negative three. Okay, they have to add or subtract to make negative three. Now, in this case, my hand is sort of forced because I have a one at the end. The only way that I can make one with whole numbers is one times one. And so I can fill in these last two places here with a one and a one, but someone help me out. What sign should be connecting the two Y and the one and the Y and the one? Are they both negative? Yeah, they are both negative. Right? Yeah, because like the last one is positive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. So right here, this plus one means that both of these last terms better have the same sign, right? Either they're both positive or they're both negative. And so when we factored, now we can put back in the sign. And so really we have this factors into two sine x minus one times sine x minus one equals zero, okay? And now, just like the previous question, once we've done the factoring, we set each piece equal to zero and we match what those are based off of the unit circle, okay? All right, so we've got two sine x minus one equals zero, and separately sine x minus one equals zero, all right? For the first equation, we'll get sine x equals one half, and the second one we'll get sine x equals one. Right. So from your handy dandy unit circle, we should get pi over six, five pi over six, and pi over two for these as our solution. Right. We have pi over six, we have five pi over six, we have pi over two. If we sketch a quick picture, that will actually tell us how many separate general solutions we need to have, okay? So, all right, pi over six should be somewhere over here. 5 pi over 6 is somewhere over here, and pi over 2 is right down the middle. I don't see any of those sort of like divide the circle right in half pairs, so it looks like we'll need to write all three as separate ones, okay? So we'll get x equals pi over 6, plus two pi k, where k is an integer, x equals five pi over six plus two pi k, where k is an integer, and x equals pi over two plus two pi k, where k is an integer. All right, so we have our green solution. Oops, we have our orange solution. And we have our pink solution. All right.
I will tell you right now that there is going to be a question that asks you to factor on the exam. Okay, so looking at these kinds of questions would be really valuable. All right, so factoring definitely on that exam on um, on Wednesday. It's a skill that I want us to have. Okay. All right, so we are in the home stretch here. Oops. We're going to take a look at trig equations with identities. All right. So I've chosen some examples that do a few different types of um, identities just to kind of get us back in the swing of like which identities are valuable, which ones come up again and again, and which ones we tend not to see as much. All right. So <clears throat> taking a look at example number 10, would you say that this one falls under the linear category or the quadratic category? Yes, I would agree, Dallas. This is one where even as soon as I start to scan, I'm like, what? Squared, it's quadratic. Okay, but how does example 10 look different from examples eight and nine? Like the last two examples that we just did, how is this different? It has sine and cosine. Yes, it has sine and cosine, all right? Now that is actually problematic for us, okay? Having sine and cosine together. So it turns out that we're going to want to rewrite with only one trig function. So we either want it to be all sine or all cosine. So either all sine or all cosine. Now, <clears throat> one of the first trig equations or trig identities that we learned was the Pythagorean one. Okay, so that could certainly be one way to look at this. And what we're going to take a look at is how can we get rid of the sine squared? So what's another way to write sine squared using the Pythagorean identity? Great, one minus cosine squared. So one minus cosine squared X is gonna replace the sine squared X. Okay, beautiful, love it, Omar, yep. And then we're gonna have minus cosine x minus one. So the rest of the equation, we didn't even touch yet. We just said, I have a clever way to rewrite sine squared. And this clever way happens to give me only one trig function in my entire equation, like one type of trig function, okay? So now let's use a little bit of algebra. We're gonna, distribute, we'll combine some terms. Let's see, we get two minus two cosine squared x minus cosine x minus one equals zero, right? And that should give us two cosine squared x plus cosine x minus one equals zero, all right? Now I did a couple of things at the same time. I combined some like terms, but I don't like to factor when my quadratic term is negative. So I moved everything to the other side, okay? That's why my cosine squared is positive. All right, now we factor, right? We've got everything on one side. We have a quadratic, we factor. So I'll give you a moment to factor that.
right? And when you think you have that factored, you can go ahead and type that into the chat or you can share that out loud. Uh, two cosine x minus one times cosine plus one. Mm -hmm. That's what I got as well. Two cosine x minus one and cosine x plus one. And just to highlight another strategy, last time Ellie shared, oh, if the last number is positive, then both the signs have to be the same. But in this case, it's a negative one. And so we're going to have opposite signs like one of them is going to be positive one's going to be negative we just have to figure out which one is which okay all right now we take each one we set it equal to zero we use our unit circle to find those solutions all right so i'll give you a moment to solve those mini equations and find out the values on your unit circle i believe there should be three all together We get in pi over three and five pi over three. Yeah, pi over three, five pi over three. And we should get x equals pi for the other one, All right? Do any of those from what you see on your unit circle look like we could condense those into like just one? solution no. yeah i don't think any of those make that straight line so we would have to write out each one as a separate solution group And there we would have our three sets of general equations, okay? All right, let me pause here for a moment. Are there any questions that are coming up for us on this example number 10? Hmm. Okay, let's see. Maybe we draw a quick picture. Whoa. All right, we've got, let's see, 
pi over three over here. We've got pi over here. We've got five pi over three down here. And yeah, that's actually a really clever observation, okay? So if we look at this, we actually have something that cuts our unit circle into three equal pieces, okay? And so I know we've only seen like, oh, two pi k, like one full time around the circle or like a half a time around the circle, but we can actually, and let me make myself a little bit of room here. We can, whoops, actually have these all as one equation if we wanted to. In fact, we could choose our smallest one, so pi over three, the pink one, plus, just like Dallas said, two pi over three, and multiples of that. In other words, we can go around the unit circle like a third, a third, a third of the unit circle, okay? So sometimes we can tell right from writing them. Sometimes if we just draw out our solutions, we can actually find that shortcut there, okay? So <clears throat> use whatever strategy you think is helpful for you, but if you can find a way to save yourself some ink, great job. I have a question about that. So like, I, I think like maybe like if I were in the exam, it might like go over my head, but if we don't write like one of those solutions, like the one Dallas said, would we get it wrong on the test or are they all correct either way? Mm, that's a great question. So part of this is I want us to be prepared like, you know, as we move through school, there are gonna be answer keys available, but I want us to be able to make sense of them. Right. So if this was your answer and then you went to check it with an answer key and this was the answer keys answer, I'd want you to know that you could figure out that they're the same answer. And not just look at it and be like, oh, my gosh, my answer is wrong. OK, so that's sort of like one skill on this exam. I would say this is a little bit trickier than I would expect. Like if it's like the ones we've seen where it's like halfway across the unit circle, I would want us to combine those. Right. But I think for something like this, I would accept either version. OK, so there's sort of like a. A yes and no answer. All right, let's take a look at example 11. OK, example 11. So part of why I've been having us write down which identity we're using is because sometimes it just looks like a string of letters and we're like, I don't even know. But the more we put like a name to a, um, the more we put a name to a specific identity, the easier it becomes to recognize that as like, oh, this looks like this identity. Okay. So in this case, I'll give you a moment to take a look at your identity sheet, which identity does this look like? Let's get a specific name. Which identity does this look like? Don't think it's the double angle one. Hmm, yeah. Now, in particular, which one is it? Is it the cosine sum or the cosine difference? Or is it the sine sum or the sine difference? Yeah, we do have a cosine difference here. Okay. So cosine difference. 
All right. And so if we're using the cosine difference, how can we write the left-hand side? In other words, what is a shorter way to write the left-hand side? Cosine of what minus what? X minus two X. Mm -hmm. Perfect. X minus two X equals our root three over two. So now let's simplify that a little bit. We'll get cosine of negative x equals root three over two. Now, what identity should I use to rewrite that left-hand side? The odd and even identities? Good. And in particular, is cosine even or is cosine odd? Even. Cosine is even. Yeah, cosine is even. Great. And so what's another way to write cosine of negative x? Good. We can rewrite it as cosine of x. And so this is a really good example of when it's all about finding the right identity, right? And so someone had asked earlier, can we write the identities on our, on our reference sheet? And I would 100% encourage you to do those, okay? Write those identities down so that you know, all right, this is this one, this is the, that one, this is the double angle, this is the half angle, or this is the summer difference one, okay? And now we've done, we've applied the cosine difference, we've applied the cosine even to end up with a problem that basically looks like the first one we started with or the second one we started with. And so now we just go to our unit circle. I believe we get pi over six and 11 pi over six. Someone check me on that, is that correct? Yeah, pi over six, 11 pi over six. I don't think there's a shortcut way for writing those. So we would just have to brute force, write out our two general solutions. All right, any questions on example 11? Okay, so we've got two examples left here. All right, we've got example 12 and we've got example 13. They look kind of similar, but they're actually gonna require some different strategies. Okay, and so what I'd like us to do is to go back into our breakout rooms and we're going to take a look at example 12 and 13. I'll give you maybe a little bit longer this time to kind of look over those, work through those together. Again, if anybody happens to have the capabilities of screen sharing, go ahead and share your screen. Um, I know it can be scary to be the person who's writing, especially if you're like, I don't really know what I'm doing, um, but I would encourage you to just kind of put yourself out there. Uh, again, we are gonna be moving towards more like sharing our thinking when we're in person in the spring. And so um, let's go ahead and um, go into those breakout rooms. Let's take maybe about 15 to 20 minutes and kind of see what we have. Um, and if your group is feeling like we're stuck on 12, well, let's try 13, right? So it's okay to say like, I don't really get this one, but let's try a different one. Same kind of strategy I would hope you use on a test. If you see a question you're like, I'm not really sure of, like, let me go ahead and just try a different one, okay? So let's go ahead and uh, hop into those breakout rooms. Do -do. And if you have any questions, you can call me into a room and I can pop on by.
All right. Um, so which one would folks like to start with, 12 or 13? Thirteen. Thirteen. All right. What were folks' ideas for thirteen? I know my group evaluated sine two theta to be um, two sine theta cosine theta. Great. What identity is that? I'm still working on names, so I do not remember at the moment. Yeah. Got that double angle. All right. So when you folks are preparing your reference sheets, I think it would be really valuable to write down the names in addition to those identities. But we can absolutely write this as two sine theta, cosine theta. Okay. All right. Um, what can we do from here? Okay, so add that sine theta, so two sine theta, cosine theta, plus sine theta equals zero. It's never a bad strategy to try. What does that allow us to do in this case? Because sometimes I think it's helpful, sometimes it might not be, but we do in fact get a greatest common factor of sine x here, or sine theta. So then we get two cosine theta plus one equals zero, all right? So I wanna pause for a moment here because in a previous problem I said, let's change everything so it all has like only sine or only cosine. But that's not always a hard, hard and fast rule. So in particular, once we've broken this down and we write our mini equations, we get sine theta equals zero. And separately, we get two cosine theta plus one equals zero. Now, this mini equation only has sine, whereas this mini equation only has cosine, so we're actually good to go, all right? So we don't always have to change everything to be the same um, trig function, as long as at the end we can somehow separate them, then that's actually okay, all right? I believe this gives us four different solutions. So the first one gives us zero and pi. The second one gives us, let's see, negative one half. So two pi over three and four pi over three. All right. Um, can any of these be combined as we think about writing that general solution? Yeah, the zero and the pi, right? If we think about that, that'll be something like this on our unit circle, right? So cutting it right in half. So we can combine these two to write a single solution. We could say theta equals the smaller one, which is zero plus pi k, where k is an integer. And then the other two, those don't form a straight line, so I think we can just say them separately. So 2 pi over 3 plus 2 pi k, where k is an integer, and then 4 pi over 3 plus 2 pi k, where k is an integer. All right. So a little bit of a different flavor. But I think, again, the key is which identities might be useful and being able to recognize, oh, sine two theta is a double angle identity, okay? All right, let's go back to example 12 here, all right? So we've got cosine two theta equals cosine theta. What are our thoughts? Cosine double, yeah, for sure. Now here's the problem with the cosine double though. We have three options. We have three options for the cosine double angle. How 
how do I know which one to use? Okay, so let's write all of them and let's just kind of see. So the first way I could write the cosine double is cosine squared minus sine squared. All right, so that's one way. I could also do one minus two sine squared theta equals cosine theta. And my last option is two cosine squared theta minus one equals cosine theta, all right? So let's take a vote. How many people think that we should use the first version? You're gonna go ahead and type one into the chat. If you think we should use the second version, type two into the chat. And if you think we should use the third one, type three into the chat, all right? One, two, or three. I see a one and a three so far. Keep sending those answers. All right, I see a lot of threes. Someone who voted three, what do we feel like is so alluring about three? Like what makes three be like, oh, we should use this one? Is you can pass the cosine data to the other side and you would have a regarded formula. Exactly. We can do matching trig functions and a quadratic. We can bring everything over to one side and just like Omar said, we can make it a quadratic equation. Okay. I haven't tried the other two, so I'm not for sure a hundred percent that they wouldn't work, but I bet they would get us there in a more roundabout way that it would be take more ink to write our answers, okay? So let's take this last way. Let's move that cosine to the other side. And we're gonna factor. All right, so I'll give you a moment to factor this. Once you have that, you can go ahead and share that in whatever form you feel comfortable with. Uh, be two cosine uh, x minus one times cosine x minus one. All right, what do we think? We can foil this out real quick. We get two cosine squared, which works out. Um, I get negative two cosine and then minus another cosine, which does not give me that middle term. I think we need to revisit that factoring there. Would it be two cosine theta plus one? Yeah, I think if we change this to a plus one, we'll end up with negative two plus one, which gives me negative one cosine. Exactly. And that also works out positive one times negative one will give me negative one. Okay. Now the factoring, now if we factor incorrectly, it's not just factoring incorrectly, it's gonna lead us to the wrong answer. Right. So there's almost like more at stake to make sure that we factor correctly. And I believe we get three solutions from this. So we should get theta equals two pi over three, four pi over three, and theta equals zero for this. All right, take a moment, sketch these out and see, do we need three general solutions? Do we just need two? Can we do one? All right, so draw those out and see what you think. I drew it out and it would be three solutions. You think it would be three solutions? 
All right, let's draw these out. All right, two pi over three is like somewhere over here. Four pi over three is like somewhere here. And zero is here. All right. Do we think that the three split the unit circle into equal pieces or not equal pieces? What are our thoughts? I don't think we have anything that cuts it like in half. Let's see, how far between the green and the pink? Like how many radians is that? Is it two pi over three radians apart? Yeah, this is two pi over three. How far is it between the pink and the orange between two pi over three and four pi over three? How far is that? Well, it would also be two pi over three, no? Yeah, it would be. And does two pi over three get us back from the orange to the green? Yeah. All right. So this is actually another example of earlier when Dallas was pointing out that Maybe it doesn't have to be cut in half. Maybe we could cut it into thirds, but that would allow us to write our solution. We choose the smallest one, which is zero, plus two pi over three k, where k is an integer. And then we only have one line to write instead of three different lines to write. Okay. Now back to Ellie's question earlier, you said like, do you have to write it this way? Are you gonna get marked off on it? No, you're not gonna get marked off, but I think that a lot of us are always looking for like, how can we write less? Or how can we do this in a more straightforward way? Or how did that book or website get that particular answer, right? And so sometimes being able to walk through that step yourself actually helps you feel more uh, able to access those resources, okay? And so this, my friends, is the end of 
7.5 and the end of the material that'll be covered on Wednesday's exam, okay? And so on Wednesday, we will have in-person office hours and we're gonna meet in our regular classroom. That's actually gonna be the same classroom that we're gonna meet in in the spring, okay? So we'll have a lot of the same stuff happening in the spring. Um, but as a last reminder before we sign off on this video, if you could please, please, please make sure to take care of those forms as soon as possible and then just send me a message um, either on Discord or email or Canvas just say, hey, um, I submitted those forms that way in case anything's missing, um, we can figure out like who's missing what and how to get that taken care of. Okay, so. Um, that being said, are there any other questions before